Welcome to the Resilience Series. I'm Stephanie Weaver, author of the upcoming Migraine Relief Plan Cookbook, which is due out this summer, is available for pre-order now, and has the theme of resilience. My guest today is Ronit Plank. Ronit is an author, podcaster, teacher, and storyteller who explores the topics of resilience, recovery, and body image in her work. Her memoir, When She Comes Back, came out in 2021, and she's a host and creator of a great podcast called And Then Everything Changed. She's also working on two brand new projects, a limited series podcast called Let's Talk Memoir and another called The Body Myth, which is based on a survey she's currently running called Your Body and the World. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail. Welcome, Ronit. Thanks for having me. I'm so glad to be here, Stephanie. It's great to see you. So we got to know each other through a writing group online and kind of during became friends during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And um, and so one of my first introductions to you was through reading your memoir when she comes back. So let's start there. Um, who is the she in the title? Who came back or who left? Um, <laughs> who did leave and who did come back? No, I'm, my uh, my memoir is about the loss of my mom to a guru. Um, his name is Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh and people may be familiar with his name or the docu-series Wild Wild Country, which was on Netflix, which is on Netflix. And that's about a six part docu-series about his time developing an ashram in India, which was um, based around initially the dynamic meditation movement in the 70s that he kind of uh, started. And then when he started a new ranch near Antelope, Oregon, um, which was called Rajneesh Puram or Rancher Rajneesh. And um, my mom left to follow him twice once when i was six and she dropped me and my sister off in new jersey to stay with our father and we were in seattle and the second time when i was about 12 and was already living with my father in um flushing queens but our family began on a kibbutz in israel so i kind of went from a communal living arrangement living very separately from my parents to then living with both my parents to then living with just my mom to then living with just my father and that's how it unfurls. Great, and it's a beautiful story and it kind of talks about coming of age and mother-daughter issues and also cults. So if you're interested in any of those things, <laughs> um, it kind of is it's the trifecta of those things. <laughs> it's a three-pronged approach. It's a three-pronged approach. Trauma and childhood. Yeah. yeah, and also I think what was interesting to me was that generally cult-related stories either focus on the person who joined the cult or sometimes the parents of the, children who you know, young adults who joined who are trying to get them back but i'd never read a story about a child who's been left behind so and the impact that that had on you so i think it's really powerful in that regard thank you thank you so much and i do want to say that i pre-ordered your amazing to your cookbook i pre-ordered it so i'm so excited i know i have to wait till july but i pre-ordered it well thank you so much <laughs> and it is available for pre-order now yes we already said that twice so <laughs> we're gonna move on <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you've had a podcast called And Then Everything Changed, where you interview people who've been through life changing experiences. What have those interviews taught you about resilience? Um, I have learned a lot through those. So I thought I understood a little bit about what resilience was. But I think part of the reason I started the podcast two years ago was to explore how people get to this place of survival. And of course, that was probably triggered by my own growth as a person and how I figured out how to have a good life despite how it started um, and to create security for myself and my children. And so what I discovered in interviewing authors and people in recovery and survivors was that lots of people go through trauma and lots of people have challenges in their life and they come in so many different shapes as I'm sure people watching know themselves. I noticed was that people, you know, people who have dealt with uh, addiction, who have overcome abuse, who have had parental abandonment. I mean, so many things, cults, coercive religions. The people that I talk to are people who have somehow figured something out, not everything, because no one figures everything out, but somehow have endured, figured something out about themselves and grown and have started to live their life based on what they've learned. And I think that change is something that is so important to our life. And I just think about it evolutionarily and also emotionally, you know, to grow and to change and to be adaptable is how we survive as people like literally and also emotionally. And so I think people are drawn to those stories and I certainly am. Absolutely. And you're such a warm, uh, sympathetic interviewer. So I think oh, part of you. why the podcast is so great 
is that you give people the space to talk and then you ask really soft but important questions and, and you kind of get people to open up to you. So I've been really impressed with how wonderful that podcast is. Thank so if you. you haven't watched it, listen to it. There's a hundred episodes out there on your favorite podcast uh, platform. So go check it out. Thank you. Um, so how do you define resilience? How does and how does that play into your work? Well, I feel like, uh, you know, as I got into the this whole podcasting journey and met a lot of people, some of whom were coaches and, you know, resilience comes up a lot, vulnerability comes a lot. And there's a lot of these I, I hate to say it, but there are a lot of buzzwords and, and they're buzzwords because they're used a whole bunch. And and I, I like to sort of think about resilience as not the, the blanket version of resilience that people may, might hashtag necessarily when it comes to my own feeling about it and more about for me, it's understanding what I've overcome and where I've where I've achieved growth and contentment, knowing what work is left to do and knowing when to push myself and when to give myself the time and and room to be calm and patient and know I'll get there. So that means if I do something and I interact with my children or with my husband, that isn't the way I'd like to interact to to realize that I owe an apology and to realize I can do better, but not to punish myself for it or think I'm a terrible person. Same with, you know, if I submit something and it gets rejected, to allow myself to be disappointed about that and not to go to that darker place where it means I'm a terrible writer or I'm a terrible producer or I don't know how to do things. Like, it, nothing is all this and it's not all that, and neither are we. And so resilience is about knowing for me when to push myself and when to pull back and allow myself to rest and do self care and how to like incorporate both of those things. That's great. I was just having a conversation with a friend of mine who's had an exceptionally difficult last six months. And, you know, she was saying, I can't even get to the grocery store and I don't know why. And I said, because that's completely normal because you're dealing with trauma. <laughs> so yeah. you just need to be easy on yourself. It's a whole and other scale, right? You just have to sort of like, it's like you almost like need these different shelves. Like I'm not doing my best today, so I need to lower, go to the lower shelf. I'm only going to do this much in this, in this shelf right here. And then when I feel better, I'll reach for the higher shelf. Yeah, I mean, so, and, I, and dealing with chronic illness, you kind of learn to live like that. Like some days it's like, okay, I got a shower done. I'm going to cross that off my list as a big accomplishment. <laughs> yes. And then, you know, and then have, you know, maybe just a few other little things that I, I'm going to try to do that day. And to so, also honor the, the fact that you know yourself best, or hopefully, you know, hopefully we get to a place where we do remember who we are and what we need the most, even though we can forget sometimes and be like, you know, I'm not judging myself against any other scale but what feels good to me, you know, not getting caught up in what other people expect. And I think it's, it's been especially difficult because there's so much talk about getting back to normal, which, and, and we had such a high expectation culture pre-pandemic. And so I, I, people are just comparing themselves to something that just isn't, wasn't realistic before the pandemic. And so, you know, people are like, I, I can't, you know, I don't know what day of the week it is. Like, I don't know what day of the week yeah. it is. You know? Also, I feel like there's been more conversation around mental health, you know, mental health awareness and how to keep ourselves um, connected and also not drive ourselves too hard, especially with our children. You know, I have two teenagers and there's been a lot of talk within the community at the school community and my friend community about just taking care of them. You know, anxiety is real. Mental health um you know, mental health fragility and, um, you know, wholeness is not like, it's not straightforward. And so people, I think are becoming more aware of that, which is helpful, you know, to realize that not all kids need to be, be pushed and drive and go to all these activities. And so I'm, I'm thankful in some ways for the space it gave parents and children to realize what they didn't want to do anymore. A hundred percent. And I think a lot of us, also looked at that as well and said, maybe I don't need to run around as much. Maybe I really prefer one on one anyway, because I can have a deep yeah. conversation. Maybe I don't need to go to a bunch of parties where I'm maybe trying to impress I people. only need to get dressed once a week, like yeah. today when I'm talking to you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then the rest of the time, you know, your sweats, your stretchy jeans, your yoga pants, your fuzzy slippers. It's all good. Yes. Absolutely. So, um, so tell us about your new project, your body in the world. Um, what prompted it and what are you hoping to learn? 
Okay, thanks for asking. Um, so I have found that when, when people re read my book, they connected with the story that people who reached out to me, but also about being a young woman coming of age in, in this country and just how it felt to be to self surveil the way we do and to grow up with so much media and so much influence from culture about how we should look and, and for me I was especially vulnerable to this I don't know that all women experienced this the way I did but I didn't have a mom in the house. And so for me, the women in magazines and on commercials were sort of this sort of placeholder for me where that was what I aspired to. And so I didn't have a lot of real woman uh, experience near me as someone to um, imprint on. So I really just kind of thought I had to look like these women. And my dad was raising me and he was really kind of focused on women when they were in his orbit and, and beauty was noticed. And so I decided that I had to look a certain way, like a lot of us do. And what I realized when women reached out to me who read the book was that they felt that too, or they had their own body image struggles, or even though they didn't grow up in my body, they felt that they were not good enough and that their body wasn't quite right. So that's been something of interest to me. And in my podcast, and then everything changed, I had some dietitians and body positive advocates and authors on. And I realized I knew I was going to work on this more. I've written about it a little bit. So I started a survey. It's a 19 question survey. It's called Your Body and the World because I really didn't want to judge it or create any kind of tone to it. It's as objective as it can be. The title of it, it it's, it's, I'm welcoming all women to take it. It takes about seven minutes long and it's going into my podcast and my my writing project associated with it. And the project of the, po the podcast is called The Body Mess. And I'm interviewing people for it now, women for it now. And they're not all experts. Some of them are, you know, they're average American women of all different sizes. Some are specialists and dietitians and body positive activists. And I'm basically asking about origin stories with weight and body and trying to understand when this started for us and how we live when we have so much we can compare ourselves to and how we can find body peace. And I, I really do feel from my limited experience so far, which is growing every day and reading the answers, that there's very little body peace for most women. And this idea that, you know, when you look a certain way, you're going to feel a certain way is is probably not totally true and so that's kind of the the hypothesis i'm working with and then my other project is um let's talk memoir because i am a, a new new memoir lover i didn't used to love memoir but after or since i started studying it and then wrote my own i love it and so i i'm having memoirists on and teachers on to talk about writing memoir their memoirs what they like in memoir and what they think is a mistake a lot of writers might make that's great so i wanted to um go back to the body myth piece of this because <clears throat> last, uh, so the summer of 2020, well, so it's hard to keep track, but know, summer too. 2020. So it was the summer of the first summer of the pandemic. So everybody is home. And one of the books that I read was a memoir um, called Out of the Pantry by Ronnie Robinson, who we both know. Yes, and she's going to be a guest on the That's body awesome. myth as well. Mm -hmm. And her story is about uh, overcoming uh, binge eating. Mm -hmm. And I started reading it kind of as a favor to her, you know, I, I bought it and uh, read it and was was thinking about maybe I would have her on one of my shows, uh, the kitchen show that I do. And the first scene in it, I still tell people about the scene because it's so powerful to me. She's at a, a, a carnival at her kid's school, and her daughter has bought a piece of pizza. And Ronnie is just fixated on when she's going to get to eat her daughter's crust because her does, daughter doesn't like the crust. And then she discovers her daughter has thrown the crust away. And she goes to the trash can and it's sitting on the top on the plate. And so she takes it out of the trash can and eats the crust. And my first thought reading that was, well, I've never taken food out of a public trash can. <laughs> And then went, oh, <laughs> maybe I'm not just reading this as a favor to a friend. Maybe this is more like about me. And it was really the first time that I started to register that I've had disordered eating and, and I've had disordered eating for 40 years because my disorder was controlling food. And, um, and so certainly while I have had some binge eating episodes and I, I was never anorexic. I was never bulimic because I always felt like, well, if I ate it, I, I need to own it. So I'm not going to let myself throw up. 
Um, so I kind of thought, well, I'm not, I'm not those two things. So therefore, you know, this behavior is completely normal because every woman I knew talked about food the way that I did, dieted, counted calories, talked about, oh, I was bad today. You know, I ate a Snickers bar, all that language. And then I ended up in the um, kind of public health arena. And so we were looking at food from um, kind of a nutrient and an illness perspective. And so because it was always sort of cloaked in health, it never registered for me that I had an issue. I had a problem mm -hmm. until the pandemic, um, which brought up a lot of issues for a lot of people. A lot of a lot of eating disorders flared up. A lot, well, a lot of addictions flared up. But you know, there was that that whole concept of like you can't have this when you want it. That kind of really. Yes. people off what's going to happen if we run out of bread or flour what's going to happen if we can't get to the grocery store you know in time before people close it yeah all that yeah and people who grew up with scarcity i think it triggered that stuff for them for people who maybe had had their disordered eating under control um like one of the things that happened for me is that i got became obsessed with Tostitos queso, which is in the jar and is sold in like convenience stores as well as the grocery store. And um, I'd never eaten it before the pandemic. So it wasn't like That's a favorite funny. food, yeah. but yeah. for some reason, one day I got a jar and got chips and then I had to have it in the house. And if the store was out, I kind of freaked out. And I, I you know, I'm pretty self-aware. So I'm like, oh, this behavior is interesting. Like what's going on here? <laughs> and, you know, my husband's yeah grew up with a lot more um, lack in his life. So his response was ordering cases of ramen and oatmeal packets, mm -hmm. and which he never ate in the 20 years that I was <laughs> with him. So it was fascinating to me, like these coping strategies, but also these kind of responses to this huge thing that was happening all over the world. It did help me in the sense that I came to realize that I have an issue, I had an issue, I have an issue, and I, um, you know, have started to address it, but it's a very long and slow process. So you and I and Ronnie and Ali Spots Lazar yes. did a did an uh, Instagram, the four of us on Instagram yeah. together, and had a conversation. And that was also really useful. That was so really I'm, nice. I'm really glad that you're, um, that you're working on this, because I think it will be really interesting to see your take on it and how you process and synthesize. Yeah, I'm, the I'm super excited. It's a really, it's a really big project because I'm writing on it as well. And I know you're going to be a guest on the body myth, which I'm super excited about. Um, I think there's so much to talk about and there's lots of different angles that we can take. And I mean, there's so much to think about when this started, what the roots of this are. And I want to just, when you were talking about, you know, maybe you're not anorexic and maybe you don't have bulimia, but you have this other disorder version of eating it kind of reminds me a little bit um, of alcohol use disorder which i learned about only about three years ago and i always thought you know you're either an alcoholic or you're not but when i learned about alcohol use disorder i realized there's a lot of gray area in there where you your relationship to something is just not maybe as healthy or as solid or as clear cut as you think and that doesn't mean you know that you're a-okay and that doesn't mean that you're you're really not in good shape. It just means there's something going on that you probably should address. And that's kind of where I feel like a lot of us are. I mean, I, I've never been anorexic. You know, I dabbled with, I guess, bulimia for like a month. I wasn't a very good bulimic and that was back in college. <laughs> and You know, thank God. And I'm sorry, I don't mean to be like dark humor about that, but you know, had I been really good at it, who knows what would have happened. But if you talk to, if you talk to any group of women, chances are they're going to either have had disordered eating or know someone who has. So this is, you know, it's sort of like an epidemic. Absolutely. And, you know, I, for me, the, the shock of realizing that what my disorder was, was controlling food and that somehow I'd never seen it. And in fact, my last book was, is an elimination diet book. And there's not a disclaimer in there because it didn't even occur to me that it might trigger people. Like that's mm -hmm. how far in the, the dieting, uh, you know, culture I was, yeah. and because it was always couched as a health, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether it's you know whole thirty, you're or you're doing a cleanse, or you're doing a you know elimination diet, or you're going off gluten, or you're going off sugar, and you know all those things are are essentially ways of controlling food. But what complicates it for me is that 
there are foods that I do need to avoid because of my migraine disease. And there are foods that if I limit them, I feel better in my fibromyalgia body. So yeah. I'm kind of so like you're tapping into those skills, like you need to know a little bit about how to do this, but it must be difficult because then you have to make sure you're not going too far. Yeah, you're not exactly. harnessing those skills, you know, more universally. around right. food. And you know, when I told my husband that I'd been counting calories since I was 19, so 40 years, he just looked at me and said, what? And then I, I tried a couple of Overeaters Anonymous meetings. He's like, what are you, what are you doing? Because his perception <laughs> of me was never that I had some issue with sure. food, right? I mean, I'm a good cook. I love to cook. I have a food blog. You know, food is pretty joyful around here. But at the same time, I was also weighing and measuring my food. I was using my fitness pal. I was, and that was the first step was deleting my fitness pal, which is, was the first step. And I wouldn't say at all that I'm recovered, but the first step in my kind of dealing with this disordered eating pattern uh, was deleting my fitness pal and then freaking out for a couple of weeks. And then What's gonna um, happen? What very, am I gonna turn into? yeah. And then very yeah. slowly allowing myself to stop measuring, um, weighing and measuring my food portions. And then, you know, and it kind of just has gone from there. And so it is tricky because, you know, when I'm developing a recipe, I need to actually know what, how much parsley yes. weight wise I'm putting in there and things like that. So it is kind of a balancing act for someone who does the work that I do. Um, but I also know that, um, you know, there's a lot of people who struggle with this. There's a fantastic podcast called Maintenance Phase that I wanted to give a shout out to um, that really deals with the whole diet culture in a really smart and funny way and super well-researched too. So it's, yeah. re it's really eye-opening, uh, the, the stuff that they get into it. It's, it's a really long in-depth podcast and it's fantastic. Okay, so tell, let's get back to resilience a little bit. So tell me about your self-care resilience strategies. This is always the last question I ask people, and it's always so interesting to hear how they respond. Yeah, well, I really do love a bath. I love a really nice hot bath, and I'll stay in there. I, I mean, there are people in my family who will stay in longer than me because we all, a lot of us like baths, but um, I am good for like an hour, an hour and 15 minutes. Are you laughing? Does that seem like a lot to you? Yes. Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, if there are people in this family who beat me. I will not name them. But um, yeah, and I'll even bring an ice cream bar into the bath or, you know, some kombucha or something fun. And I'll read, I'll read something or I'll scroll the news like gossip sites. That's like when I do my like junk food reading. And um, I just enjoy like, you know, basically tuning out. I also really, really like sometimes just sitting on the couch, plopping on the couch and reading something and just not making myself do anything. Those are really big self-care things for me. I don't have to like go to a spa or, you know, get a massage. I, I just like to be quiet in my house and not push myself to do something. Just have unscheduled time when no one is needing anything. I don't have to cook or do laundry. I, I'm not worried about a deadline. That's like so, so great. I just took a big sigh because just hearing you talk about it just made me relax and I, yeah. I do think that unscheduled time is something we don't think about as a self-care strategy but is really important and I started we we take the dog to the park every night now after dark because of the pandemic and trying to be there when it's less busy but I don't bring my phone and so it's the only time of day when my phone isn't kind of within reach mm. and it's amazing how helpful that 30 minutes 45 minutes oh, is gosh, where yeah. i'm looking at the stars or in the summer i'm sitting on the grass i call it my grass time and looking up at this beautiful pine tree and i don't have to be anywhere i don't have to do anything nobody it's needs so me for anything yeah the other thing that i've been doing lately is not, it's not it just sort of happened because i started taking doing some yoga classes again which i really do love i i actually do like hot yoga a little bit but I've noticed when I walk, I notice that one of my feet, you know, I'm like my feet are on the ground, but one goes a little like this. I want to kind of go like that. So I started straightening my foot out a little bit. And then I realized, you know, when I when I get up in the morning, I'm trying to make sure all parts of my feet uh, hit the ground and then I can feel it. So sometimes I slow down enough, even when I'm doing something in the kitchen to make sure all four part like corners of my feet are touching the ground and be aware of how I'm making contact, which I think there is something really powerful about the physical part of you, you know, and mindfulness. And so that's enough to just make me notice my body and kind of drop in a little bit more. That's great. 
Ronit, thank you again for being here today. Please visit Ronit Plank, that's R-O-N-I-T-P-L-A-N-K.com to learn more about her work. You can find When She Comes Back wherever you like to buy books. We do like to encourage people to support independent bookstores. Check out other episodes of the Resilient series on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Follow me at S. Weaver MPH to learn more about my upcoming book, The Migraine Relief Plan Cookbook, which is due out this summer from Surrey Books and is available for pre-order now. Thanks so much for watching.